Okay, hello everybody. Uh, we are still uh, waiting actually for uh, people who are all the time uh, adding themselves uh, to the chat. But I'll start and I hope you will all enjoy. As to questions uh, during the lecture, I will be glad if all the questions will be asked after the lecture, so we will have enough time to do all of this. So what I'm going to do today is to talk about the mono implants. Uh, actually, it's like a narrow topic. It's a narrow implant also, actually. But actually, it's an implant that was designed for narrow uh, ridges, but actually is being used for many applications. And what I'm going to do today is to speak about it. I'm going to speak about its application in various spheres uh, within the dental field. Uh, and I would also show many clinical cases. And I have also a chapter that will deal with the digital, with the digital part, with the CAD CAM. So all the aspects concerning these implants will be covered. So please uh, keep your questions in mind or write them just uh, in front of you. So at the end, uh, you can ask. Anyway, maybe during the lecture, uh, the questions will be cleared uh, gradually. So actually, I'm speaking about, we're speaking about an implant for cemented restorations. Actually, because this implant goes out from the gingiva, this implant is meant for immediate loading. Otherwise, uh, there is no good reason to put it in. Uh, the implants are FDA cleared for uh, immediate loading. Uh, actually, the implant, I think that the main advantage of the implant is that this implant doesn't have a connection between the abutment and the implant. So this prevents actually all the bacterial leakage that can go within the abutment and the implant. Because we have to consider that even when the abutment and the implant are tightly closed, uh, we have to take into consideration that in the mouth and under pressure, it all the time works. The bacteria accumulates there and as to literature, as to my opinion, as a more than 20 years uh, practitioner, uh, the bacteria harms the bone. So this implant, when everything uh, succeeds, when everything sits good, there will be very, very slow bone loss. So uh, this is another advantage of the implant. Uh, Norris has a very wide dimension range of the implant from three to five millimeters width and lengths ranges from 10 to 18 millimeters. By the way, this thing happened uh, with all the companies because uh, those implants uh, started as very, low, uh, very narrow implants that uh, worked only for the mandibular incisors and narrow ridges and uh, lateral incisors in the upper jaw. But with the time, um, clinicians and implant companies understood that this implant is used not only for narrow cases. Now, this implant has a very unique feature, which is a bendable neck. Now, why to have a bendable neck? Because even if we think that we put the implant okay and everything is in place, we can always have the opportunity to change a little bit the angulations of the implant. So uh, in this thing, um, Norris Medical are act is actually almost the first company that did that. So uh, as to the definitions of the FDA clearance, we have to clarify that this implant, when, it's, when immediate loading is done, on one tooth, um, you have to, of course, to do it a non-occlusal provisional. 
because otherwise it ha will have no chance to survive. Uh, and of course, when we have some implants in the same jaw, we must connect uh, the, the implants together in order to give all the system the chance to work together and the implants to work together as splinted implants when they are loaded immediately. As I said before, uh, the implant is indicated to all bone types, all bone width, small prosthetic uh, spaces, as to also large prosthetic spaces. Um, and of course, uh, their, uh, let's say, original objective, which is to replace maxillary, maxillary lateral incisors, mandibular incisors, and of course, in narrow alveolar regions. Now, when we have the option to bend the implants, we have a large variety that is added. A another thing that we can see is that the tip of the implant, when we're speaking about 3.75 millimeters of an implant, the tip of the implant is uh, 2.4 millimeters, what actually says that if you work with a pilot drill, which is two millimeters more or less, uh, in most cases of the upper jaw, I use only the pilot drill, and in the lower jaw, I'm using the pilot drill, and maybe the 2.8 millimeters only to counter sink, um, because I need the primary stability of the implant. Of course, the implant itself is self-tapping. The implant is condensing excellently the bone. Uh, the implant is very uh, high, initially stable, and of course, suitable only for immediate loading. So here you can see the chart, the recommended chart. As I told you before, it of course appears in the catalog, but in most cases, pilot drill will be sufficient for 3, 3.3, 3.75. Try to use the minimal set possible, the minimal uh, set of uh, drills possible in order to insert this implant. Of course, uh, while not creating a loud stress on the bone. So here, this, was, this picture was actually taken from the catalog. And the thing that I want to show you is actually the number where is written a D2. D2 is actually the width of the length of, of the width of the neck of the implant. So you can see that the width of the neck is two millimeters for implants in uh, diameters three and 3.3. But when we are going to 3.75, actually the neck of the implant goes to 2.5. 2.5 millimeters for titanium is a too strong metal and not flexible in order to bend it. That's why we can see that when we have the bendable implants, the D2 goes to 1.8 only. So by definition, implants in width of three millimeters and 3.3 millimeters are bendable. As to implant 3.75 and 4.2, we have two types. We have bendable and we have non-bendable. So the only bendable implants are actually 3.75 and 4.2 by definition. And uh, as I said, by default, you have also 3 and 3.3. Of course, when you use the five millimeters, don't think, of course, of bending the neck of the implant because it will always be not bendable. Uh, now, please notice that uh, in 4.2, we have also 18 millimeter uh, length of implants. Uh, you may ask, why 18 millimeters? It's too big. Uh, consider that because this implant is used for immediate implantation and immediate loading, the length of a canine can reach 25, three centimeters. And, we are, and if you're talking about the bone level, you can reach very easily the root area to 15, 16 millimeters. So sometimes the implant of the 18 millimeters is a real saver 
because all this length does not go necessarily to the bone, it goes to the sockets. Here I can show you again the comparison. Here you can see the D2, 2.5, 2.8, and uh, in comparison, 1.8 for D2. So what do we have? We have here a drill of 1.5 millimeter. This drill is only a marked drill. And here you can see it, NMD2315. Uh, this works only for the drill, so it won't slip from the bone. You can use it. It looks like a dentatus drill. Uh, here you have a motor mount. By the way, I never use the motor mount. Uh, I try always to use um, always the hand tool. And if I have no choice to use the ratchet, because I still think that the tactile uh, feeling in the hands and in the fingers is the most important. As to keys, by default, every implant comes with a carrier, which is actually a metal key that goes with the implant to the end. It doesn't come with a plastic carrier. So this is a very important thing uh, to remember. Uh, now look at the NMX1720. You may ask yourself, why do we need such a long key? Uh, so consider that this implant is meant also to replace a single tooth, uh, let's say between two other teeth. So sometimes the regular key is too wide to go there. That's why we have long keys. Uh, if you didn't touch the implant while preparing it, uh, always to take an impression, if you take an impression with putty and wash, of course, to do it with an analog, because it will always transfer an analog, will take the most accurate impression possible. Of course, if you touched uh, the implant, uh, the analog is not is out of question. Uh, I'll show you some cases uh, in order to show you that uh, those implants are actually in the market uh, for 20 years. When we started, we didn't use these implants uh, uh, in, in a wide variety of uses in the jaw. Uh, here I can show a classical case. It's not mine, it's my friend's uh, case. Here you can see still the silk sutures. It was done something like 20 years ago. Here you can see the metal frame, the x-ray, and this implant sits very good. When it sits very good, two, three, four, first year, usually it will last many years because there is no connection between implant and abutment. Another case done by me, 2004, teeth number 42, 32. Uh, the ridge is actually long but narrow. Uh, and here I placed three narrow implants uh, and the implants are functioning very good. Here you can see the restoration that was done on three implants. And this is how it looks today. Actually, nothing has changed when the implant are sitting there. Another case, last, last old case. Uh, again, same area, 32 to 42. I don't know even why did I use uh, three implants instead of two. I don't, I don't remember really what when I felt that uh, it, maybe it is uh, too thin in order to withstand the forces. I made my uh, technician life uh, really uh, difficult. So this is how it looks. Uh, a little bit of bone resorption, but actually for more than 16 years, I think that the result is uh, satisfying. So this is how it looks. And uh, this is the bridge. And the reason that the gums are a little bit red is because the patient uh, went with the bridge for one or two weeks and the bridge was moving. So actually she had a little gum inflammation when she came to me. Uh, so we're going to the mono and what I'm going to show you actually, not in all case, of course, uh, I will show you uh, the final 
result, with the final results, for me to show you the temporaries are the most important things because when the implant succeeds with the temporary, actually the uh, final crown is not the issue here, but in most of the cases, I'll show you also a final result. So this is a patient that came actually uh, with tooth number 22. The tooth has uh, had a fracture. Here is the extraction of the tooth, actually went very easy. This is the implant. 3.516. Now, if you look very good, you can see that the socket is very deep. So we have maybe six, seven millimeters that are holding actually in the bone. As you can see, uh, the width between the two, the teeth is actually pretty narrow. So this is the implant. Here you can see also the occlusal ratios between the upper jaw and the lower jaw. Um, and here you can see the implant, of course, in an occlusal view. And here, of course, I take a temporary crown, regular one, just putting acrylic in and a final crown that the patient can go with it in four months. So a very similar case is for tooth number 21. A patient came to me in the middle of a, of a busy day. We can say it like that. And we extracted the tooth, put the implant. This is the tooth. Uh, this is a typical case. Uh, the, fruit, the root, of course, was fractured. Uh, this is actually the main reason in most cases that this, to, this teeth uh, just fall away. So this is the implant and I remind you again extraction and implantation. So this is the temporary crown that I did right away and four months after he gets this result. I, I remind you tooth number 21. Uh, the result is um, I think uh, actually satisfying and here you can see the final x-ray how it looks. Uh, this is a full zirconia crown. Here I want to show you uh, actually a movie that will show you how the bending of the implant really works. Here you can see it is done very, very easily. I think that the most uh, difficult thing here is to find really the hole in order to go in. The trick here is to do the minimal uh, width of the holes. Here, as you can see again, I'm bending the implant. Here you can see the lower jaw. I see from the beginning that I will have to bend also this implant. Again, we are doing the same thing with the tool. Uh, and actually, we have a new innovation. Uh, this innovation was not, uh, actually, we really started with it. It doesn't really appear now in this presentation, but we have 
a new special key for bedding the implants. Actually, uh, the new implant will have two very, very um, important features. The first thing, it will have an hex on the implant. So if by the bending process, the neck of the implant will be broken, the same key will be able to take out the implant. Because think that in the regular mono implants, if you broke the neck of the implant, that's it. Uh, it will be a little bit difficult to take out the implant. And uh, the key will also have two points of grasping. It grasps itself in the tip of the abutment and in the neck. And the most important thing it, is that it doesn't make any pressure on the bone. So here you can see a plastic model. This is, a, this is actually a movie that was done especially for me by Mr. Rami Ziv, the um, uh, head of the uh, company, previous. Here, like here, as you can see, the, the new key actually holds uh, uh, the abutment and the hex in the implant. As you can see, this implant goes deep in a very, very strange angle. Yeah, and here you can see how very easily this implant is actually bent to the right place. Now, for those of you who want to know where should the neck be? Of course, the neck should be below the gingival line. So this is very important. Uh, here we continue. We are adding another uh, implant just to show you. And here you can see also that the insertion of the implant, by the way, the threading of the implant uh, has changed a little bit. Here you can see again the hex of the implant. You should hear a click when it goes in and then very, very easily the implant goes in. When it goes in, when we work with this key, I know that no pressure is actually applied on the bone during the bending process of the implant. By the way, very important to say here that if you over inserted the implant and you don't have the hex, uh, the key will still work because it will grasp the implant from the abutment. And you can always use the conventional key in order to do that. As you can see, you can bend it very easily even up to 45 uh, degrees and sometimes more um, very easily without harming the bone, even when the bone is weak. So here we can see tooth number 43, the tooth is broken. Opening a little flap in order to know where is the uh, bone, placing an implant a bit to the buckle and bending the implant a little bit to the mesial, a little bit to the lingual, and a temporary crown in the process of his making in the clinic. Uh, this is a very interesting case. I like it very much. Uh, this case is actually um, after, uh, by my point of view, uh, not, uh, success, not so successful uh, orthodontic treatment. Actually, the patient came to me and she had uh, this uh, space between tooth number 22 and 24. Actually, I'm not sure that the orthodontic treatment really, um, really uh, accomplished his, um, um, well, I, I would say, I would say his, his original, um, original need. And actually she had a space, this space uh, really, really disturbed her. 
and she wanted um, a solution. Of course, I uh, advised her to go back to the orthodontist. Uh, she refused. She didn't want to hear about it, and she wanted me to do implants. So as you can guess, uh, I like to take challenges. And this is the challenge. This is the implant 3.3 uh, mono implant. This is how this space looks. This is how the implant looks. Of course, it goes, uh, it will be too high, so I have to trim from the abutment. So here I bend the implant to the desired place. Here is uh, the, the new angle. Now you can see that it is lying, uh, lined with the lateral and the premolar. Now I can trim the implant and to do in place a temporary crown. This is, uh, this is also an interesting case of tooth number 11 that looked quite good. And the patient asked me if I can extract this tooth and maybe to keep the tooth itself as a temporary crown. And actually, this is what I did. So this is tooth number 11. I gave some anesthesia, extracted the tooth. I put an implant in the desired angle. This is the tooth. I actually trimmed it with a disc. Then I took off all the dentin from the tooth and left uh, uh, a thin uh, enamel shell. Okay, as you can see here, a little bit of acrylic and the original tooth of the patient is back. No occlusal contacts. So the patient was very happy with that. And uh, I think that uh, and everything worked good. But after a year, uh, I told him I cannot really give you back the tooth because after all, I used an acrylic resin in order to do that. So we did the final crown. So this is the temporary. Here you can see it doesn't sit very good, actually, because it's acrylic and it is his original tooth. And this is the final result, tooth number 11. I think that the result is relatively satisfying. Uh, again, if, if we are speaking about using the teeth of the patient, here we have tooth number 23 extracted, trimmed, again, the same thing, and was used as a temporary count. Actually, a temporary crown that uses the original tooth of the patient uh, may look a very uh, nice result. It looks, I think, very natural. Uh, here you can see the result. And this patient was uh, sent back to the doctor that referred her uh, to me. And he did, I think he did um, uh, the final crown uh, although this crown set very good and the acrylic doesn't go, I think, even below the gingiva. She was very happy with the result. Uh, here you can see tooth number 13. You can see the carriers there. So usually the patients come when the tooth actually breaks. So this is the situation that the patient comes. And he wants a solution, of course, at the same day. He doesn't want uh, to go even not an hour or two in this. So extracting the tooth, doing the implant, very easy. Uh, this is a very good opportunity to note that when we do the implant in the anterior area, please never put the implant at the original place where was the uh, socket always you have to drill in the palatal aspect of the socket otherwise i can promise you that the bone resorption will always happen in the vocal area so uh, here you can see temporary crown made by me in the clinic and that's it teeth number 14 and 15 the teeth are uh, here in this case the teeth are fractured so Again, same day, one hour, and the patient has a result. So these are the teeth. Uh, usually the patient comes in a dramatic state. Look how it looks. I have to have a solution now. 
We are living in Israel after all. So this is how it looks. And this is the bone. No exposing actually, just extracting the teeth. These are the two implants. Note that I always prefer to put the implants slightly to the palatal. So this is how it looks. And these are the temporary crowns. And this is the final crown. And of course, a restoration was done in tooth number 13 in order to fix the carriers and the gap. Here, here, it, uh, here is the result. As you can see, the neck in this implant is always by definition an undercut. So we never go below. So only if you have a really uh, special case and you have to make the neck of the implant and the abutment in the same width. Otherwise, you don't go below the neck because you don't pass the undercut. A very important note in this case, if you are using, um, if you are using a temporary cement that is based on, um, let's say, a material like monourethane, we use it a lot in Israel, if this material, if you put too much and it goes below the undercut, it may block the crowns inside. And then when you want to remove the temporaries, you will just have to cut it. So please always note when you are cementing the temporary crowns to do it uh, in a very gentle way. So the cement especially when the cement is too strong so it won't go to the undercuts and then uh, it will make your life very difficult uh, in order to take out the the temporary crowns uh, t42 32 again a uh, patient is requiring uh, an immediate solution so these are the teeth they are moving the patient is suffering Extracting the teeth, two implants. Uh, actually, I put this implant there because there I found the best bone in order to put the implants. So this is how it looks. And uh, note that in most cases, I don't touch the implant surface. I try when I make the implants, when I put the implants, uh, to calculate it right so the tip of the bantut will be in the right place. Either if I bend it, if either if I put it, I try as much as I can not to trim the implant. Here are the implants as they look. Here is the temporary. And here you can see the final result. Uh, the reason that you don't see uh, the on the neck is that because this implant is, is this crown is done on uh, zirconia, a full zirconia. So because the x-ray, of course, is not 3D, uh, it seems like it goes over the neck. Teeth number 24, 26, uh, and immediate loading. The patient is a bruxist, actually, uh, a very difficult case, but no chance that the patient will go out of the clinic without teeth or with a removable denture. As you can see, the amount of left bone is very problematic. So here are the extraction, the implants, a closed sinus lift that was done immediately. Uh, here you can see how the patient went in. This is how the patient went out. And these are, these are temporary crowns that were done in the clinic by me. Today, I'll show you later, all the cases are done digitally. I'm gradually, um, happily, I'm forgetting how to do imp uh, crowns from acrylic. It is all done by 3D printers, but we'll speak about it later. Uh, this is how it looks, so you can imagine it. And this is a short movie that shows actually how it's done. Uh, sorry. Here.
as you can see, it's a real time video. Um, I didn't work on the video. I didn't edit it. This is the main video, how it's done, how the implants are put. It's a very fast process. So just to see how it works. Now, of course, in this case, we cannot bend the implants. So we will continue actually to the next. Here I prepare the implants so they will fit the occlusion. I can see here that uh, people here uh, are asking questions. Uh, I'll give enough time in order to uh, answer the questions because there are many participants here. Uh, I, will not, I will not be able to relate now to questions, but uh, I promise you that uh, no questions will be unanswered uh, at the end of the process. This is uh, actually a big mono case. Uh, if we go out of the frame. So here are the teeth of the patient. Of course, he expects an immediate solution. Uh, this patient weighs something like uh, 120 kilos. Um, of course, he promised me that he will eat very gently, but I knew that, uh, I, and he is really, really afraid of uh, dentists. So here I had a very good opportunity uh, to treat him. And this is what I did, actually. I took the implants out. I promised, I took the teeth out. I promised him that he's getting a bridge in two hours. Uh, my technician uh, did a, very, a beautiful work and he really did it in two hours. Uh, and it is really amazing. I tried to put the implants as parallel as possible. You know that here you don't have to use even parallel pins because you have the abutments and the, they are actually serving as a parallel pins. So this is uh, how the patient came in uh, and this is how the temporary bridge looks two hours, two hours and a half after the procedure. And this is the metal frame and this is the final result. Again, the important thing is how the work sits on the implant. Again, here you can see um, a bendable case. Here, a, actually my main purpose was to um, go, do a bending of the implant just uh, in front of the um, mental nerve. So I want to show you first the x-ray and then I will go back. So in this, in this, uh, in this x-ray, actually, I wanted, I'll start from the end. This is the mental nerve. I wanted to go just, just near to the nerve. I exposed the nerve and then I did the implants. So here I go back and I'm telling you the whole story and the truth behind everything. So actually what I did is I extracted the teeth and I left only tooth number 47 in order to hold. Then I actually found the mental nerve. Here you can see it between the fourth and the fifth. So actually, this is how it looks. Here you can see the mental nerve. The mental nerve is just under the uh, periostal elevator. Here you can see the mental nerve. You must expose the nerve in such a case. Here, as you can see, I do the implant in 45 degrees and I just 
go uh, in front of the nerve without touching the nerve. And then I bend to the implant so it will go in the same uh, angulation like tooth number 47. As you can see, here is the implant. This is the abutment. It is completely parallel to tooth number 47. Then I tried to add an implant lingually to the implant that didn't really touch. But as you can see, in the end, I will remove it because I don't need it. I just put it as a spare implant. So here is how the work looks. Again, I didn't touch the abutments. As you can see, they are intact. And this is the implant. And this is how it looked in the x-ray. They didn't really touch, but I removed it. This is the temporary bridge. And this is the final result two years after. Another, another case, here you can see, um, this is a patient uh, that came to us from Nepal. All her teeth were moving and she also wanted a fast result. So here we extracted, she wanted to actually start with the upper jaw. We extracted all the teeth. We placed mono implants. This is how it looks. They are they are parallel. I almost did not bend implants. As you can see again, most of the implants, most of the abutments are intact. Here, here is how it, uh, here, it, here you can see in the picture how it really looks. This is the temporary and this is the final result. This is the technician has sent it to me from his telephone. Now I want to show you uh, a full case movie that was done two years ago and enjoy.
Uh, I hope you enjoyed the movie. Uh, I see all the time that you ask uh, questions. Um, I promise again, I, I will answer them. We reached actually the last part of the lecture. Uh, and this is the digital age of the implants. Well, you know, it's actually a thing that I really, really love all the digital age. Um, those of you who will join me to further lectures will see how I work with CATCAM. I, I do amazing things with it. Uh, here, actually, I'm using the CATCAM without any uh, transfers, just scanning the implants. The implants are uh, actually are very friendly, especially to three shape scanner. Uh, and I do it very, very easily. Now I can show you how I do the cases very easily, extract the tooth, do the implants, bend them, and then I scan it. It takes not more than five minutes. After 45 minutes, the patient gets from a printer um, a final bridge. Actually, I'm lucky enough that my technician is uh, five minutes walk from me, so she does all the, all the printing work, but... Um, Actually, I think that uh, really I can say um, that this is an immediate loading in an hour. So I'll show you some cases and uh, share with you my joy, uh, and then I will answer your questions. So here you can see uh, teeth number 13. Uh, it was a crown that was broken. And this is how the patient gets to me. And of course, he would like an immediate result. So. This is the tooth extracted. This is the implant. Again, I started the angle that I want. And during the implant insertion, I can correct the implant angulation. In addition to the fact that I bend it at the end of the process. And this is the implant in its final place. Then we get to the digital scanning. After all, a very nice scan because uh, actually uh, you can understand that the implant is located in the palatal part, in the palatal aspect of the, of the socket. So uh, don't be surprised if the buckle to the implant, it's all uh, empty, of course. Uh, usually I put the bone after the scanning. Uh, it, it, it reflects less and this is more comfortable for me. This is how it looks. This is the crown. This is how it comes. That's it. No plaster. Uh, not, not, no, no more heavy bags. And this is how it looks. It goes in. It clicks. Sometimes, because I don't touch the implant, even, uh, even a cement is almost unnecessary. So this is the final result after an hour. And the patient is really happy with that. So this is how the implant looks. Here, teeth number 32, 42, the teeth are really moving. So here uh, I did a pre-scan. And uh, according to the pre-scan, the technician can know how did her teeth look, how, how were uh, her teeth looking. So actually those are the abutments. And then here in this case, uh, I really bent the implant with my finger. Uh, this is a bad habit that I have. 
and this is the final angle of the implant. I think that they are quite parallel one to another. This is how it looks in the digital. Uh, this is the occlusal, and this is the result. Again, a little bit light, but uh, here after, after four months, we actually finished the work. Uh, I try in these cases uh, to put the uh, crowns a little bit uh, submerged and not uh, touching occlusally. Here is how it looks, as you can see. Uh, another case. Teeth uh, number 33 to 43. Uh, the patient has some uh, more problems, but the, she insists she insists to do only this. So these are the teeth. This is how they look. Here you can see the gum inflammation. Again, everything is done at the same day. Antibiotic is given one or two days prior to the surgery. Here are the implants, and here is the digital scan, again, after minor corrections of the uh, angles of the implants. Look how it looks. I have another feature that I can see the, uh, here you can see the green marks. This green marks is actually the insertion path of the implant. Here you can see the insertion path. As long as it is green or yellow, it is still fair then I can uh, just make the minor correction, the minor bendings in order to get a nice result. This is how it looks from another view. This is the breach. And this is how it looks. Of course, I try not to go below the gums with the uh, temporary breach. What I wanted to tell you also is that the neck uh, also creates a very nice uh, gingiva building um, um, in the in the circle or uh, around the the abutment of the crown. It goes like uh, uh, like the platform shifting, but of course there is no connection here, so it's only better because it gives the bone a lot of place to grow into. Uh, here we can see teeth number 32 to 42 um, is more than 80, the patient. Here you can see extraction of the teeth, two crown, two implants, abutments, and again, uh, the temporary crown after one hour. Here you can see the result. Uh, again, Teeth number 23 to 25, we need to extract them. Here is, the, here is how she came. This is the result. Again, no touching of the implant. I always try to, to um, conserve the energy, do the minimum required actions in order to get an optimal uh, result. Sorry that uh, it sounds like a slogan, but this is uh, what I really believe. Uh, this is how it looks. This is the bridge, and this is how it looks in the mouth. Um, by the way, I got my uh, I got my my scanner because I had uh, another scanner from another company that was not able to do that. Uh, I got this scanner only uh, six months ago, so uh, most of the cases uh, you will see no follow ups. Uh, here I wanted to show you the technique because uh, this technique is also new to me uh, because only this scanner for me could really do the could really do the work. So uh, this is an extreme case, by the way. You can look about you can look at teeth uh, number twenty two to twenty six. Those are failing implant twenty five years ago. Uh, this was really, really a difficult case. So here is the here is how it looks. Then I took out the teeth. I then then I leave then I left two implants, but at the end I decided to take them all out because they were unstable. As you can see, the first implant, tooth number twenty-two, I have to bend it. 
So again, I'm putting the key, I'm putting the tool, bending it, that's it. See how easy it goes in. Note, by the way, that the note is always, that the neck is going as much as possible below the gingiva. Uh, in this case, uh, I took a pre-scan. Uh, here you can see how it looks. Again, this is the scanning and this is the final bridge that, it, that she got one hour and a half after the procedure. Here is, our, uh, here is the uh, final result. You can see that tooth number 27 is a pterichor implant. This is a pterygoid implant, also by Norris. This is the best pterygoid that I've ever seen because the neck is uh, smooth. Uh, the implant, uh, I, I do only one drilling the implant itself contains the bone. Uh, here you can see that 25 goes like into the sinus, but actually it goes on the palatal wall of the sinus. In other case, uh, teeth number 14 to number 17. Uh, here there is uh, a sinus lift that was done 20, 25 years ago. Those implants are failing. Uh, so this is the case. I just touched the bridge and he went out. So this has our uh, four um, mono implants. This is after I bent them to optimal angles. Here are the abutments, the scan, lower scan, occlusion, and final bridge. See how we, uh, not final bridge, of course, temporary bridge that was given finally to the patient. And this is how it looks. T14 to 17. Here, this is the last case that I'm going to show you. Here you can see the fracture of the tooth and you can see the fistula taking out the teeth, putting four implants. In this case, I had to work on the implants. Here is the relation between the occlusion, scanning, and temporary bridge. Thank you very much. So now I'll go to your uh, questions. Um, first uh, questions that I was asked by uh, Alessandro Susino, is uh, hello Alessandro. Uh, is do you feel confident to bend the implant also in soft bone or in an immediate post X socket? Very good question, actually. And uh, the answer is uh, that it's tricky, and uh, that was the reason that we developed the next generation of the implant, which contains also a hex in the implant. And then when the new key really catches the implant from the neck and from the abutment, we almost cancel the forces that are applied on the bone. Uh, yes, if I use implants that are long enough and if you are uh, experienced, uh, you, can, uh, really, um, you can really solve the, you can really solve the matter because you can feel how much uh, possibility the bone really enables you to do. But as a thumb rule, I would say that um, when I'm placing the implant, I'm not thinking about placing and bending. I'm always trying to put the implant in the ideal position and then to do with bending minor correction. And the reason is that I am afraid to break the bone. Even if it's not a big risk, it will always be good to be careful. A other question I was asked by uh, Nazar Babinski, he asked me, what about buccal bone resorption in uh, case with tooth number 21? A, as long as I put the implant uh, in the palatal part of the socket, uh, and when the gap is bigger than two millimeters, of course, always I'll put non-reservable xenograft uh, like BIOS, and I almost prevent always um, a bone resorption. Now, the fact that I'm not cutting the gingiva, that I'm not raising a flap, 
this itself is uh, is already a solution in order to minimize bone reserve uh, bone uh, resorption. Uh, I was asked by Alessandro Zino, uh, do you have a long-term success uh, rate? Uh, actually, I have a 20 years uh, success rate with those implants. Um, I actually left those implants for something like uh, 16 years and then went back to them uh, three years ago. And this was uh, especially because I saw that over the years, almost most of the implant that I did uh, really succeeded. The fact that Norris developed the bendable implants really helped me uh, to jump to the water again and to do them. I was really afraid to do them because even me as an experienced, um, as an experienced um, practitioner, I was always afraid that I will not be able to correct the angle uh, after implant placement. So I can say that uh, for the new cases here, the actually I followed them in something like three years, but I have a, a very long-term follow-up um, that works really, really good uh, with the implant. Uh, Basim Shakir, yes, I use bone grafts in, uh, uh, in, in, in gaps that are bigger than two millimeters. But I will not open a flap in order to make a bone graft especially. Uh, Reza Amjadi uh, asked me, when we grind the abutment, what is the best way uh, for, a, for impression? And then uh, pure that. So, as I told you, I'm trying always not to grind uh, the abutments, but always remember, because 10 years ago, I was giving a lot of lectures about uh, bone substitutes. Don't forget that titanium is after all uh, by itself a xenograft. So uh, there, is not, uh, there is no problem uh, uh, to do it because the titanium itself, of course, I rinse it very good afterwards, it has never been a problem to grind the buttons in the mouth. But um, of course, I always try not to grind, just to put the abutment in place, to put the implant in place, and I try not to grind. But I didn't see any remnants of titanium that really stained the gingiva over the time, nevertheless. So actually, I uh, answered all the questions. Uh, and if you don't have uh, any more, uh, here I have, do I have her here? No, actually, actually, I, when we grind the abutment, what is the way, best way for impression and then pure that. Um, yes, when we grind the abutment, uh, the best way of impression that I knew let's say till a year ago, is only to do a putty and wash. Sometimes alginate worked very good for me when they, for temporaries, of course, for, um, for um, uh, the fixed crowns, of course, only putty wash. Today, I do all the cases grinded, not grinded at the day of surgery. All the implants, all the cases are done uh, digitally. Uh, as I was asked, uh, as I was asked also by Tom, uh, are the mono implants FDA approved for USA and Canada? Uh, as far as I know, yes, they are FDA approved. But please, uh, uh, I will I will uh, refer someone that really deals with that uh, in order to answer the question after I uh, give the microphone back to Norris. So, um, okay, a strategy to replace tooth number 26, a single molar tooth. Well, the best, uh, the best way for me is to put a single implant in the palatal root of the tooth. Now, as a rule thumb, uh, if the tooth is not seen, actually, uh, I try to avoid immediate loading, but if it's a single tooth, it mustn't be in the sinus, it, uh, used uh, with a sinus lift. It has to be. It has to be 
if you do a sinus lift and a single implant, never load it. But uh, if you have enough bone, you can put the implant in, uh, in the palatal root of tooth number 26 and to immediate load it, of course, to submerge the, the crown. Uh, Dr. Vishal uh, Panjwani asks me, is it always necessary to place pterygoid implant when we replace 24, 25, 26, 27 tooth areas? If we want to avoid the sinus or if we are not uh, sure enough, I think that pterygoid implant can give us extra security. Uh, now, not note that uh, it is actually very easy to put uh, uh, the pterygoid implants. It's a technique that, uh, although the implant is very long, but the technique is very, very easy to, uh, to master. Well, I'm asked here by uh, Dr. Muhammad Alubayat, what is the maximum torque for bendable implant insertion? Um, a very good question. Uh, of course, it depends a little bit by the neck. Uh, the second generation of the implant that we did avoids the problem of breaking necks when you insert the implant and you think that the implant goes in, but actually you bend the neck uh, in strong bone. I would say that 40, 50 newtons are not a problem, but I, you have to be very, very careful that you always put the implant in. With the new key and with the new type of implants, you will never, uh, you, you can use actually an unlimited torque because the neck is actually uh, apart from the uh, implant. Here I can show you I hope that you can see it very well. I'll try to focus it maybe better, but the key after all is a little bit opened and then it is just, it just clicks to the implant and then uh, there will be no, no problem with the, I'll try to put it in focus. Yes, I cannot really assure it because I'm a very small picture in the, uh, monitor but here i can show you that here you can you can insert it, insert it in an unlimited torque at all because you cannot break the neck um okay uh, dr reza uh, amjadi uh, asks me when we grind the abutment what is the best way for impression and then pure that Actually, I asked, uh, I answered alginate for temporaries and putty wash for the fixed. Uh, Dr. Muhammad uh, Alubayat asks me, and why do you use a temporary cement? It will not help in splinting the implant and spread the load to all implant. Uh, especially when I do temporary implant, I, yes, you are right. When you put a temporary cement, it is always problematic. I'll tell you what I do. I always try that the bridge will be, uh, will sit very tight on the uh, abutment, that the bridge by itself will be as much retentive as possible. Then I use a small amount of monourethane, uh, that is a stronger uh, uh, cement, uh, the reason that I use a small amount is that it will not go under the undercut. I think that in this case, and when you are talking, when you are taking into consideration that every case that is cemented, uh, you cannot really assure that all the implants get the same force. Um, so I think that um, actually I use a temporary cement relatively strong one, but with small amount. Another question that I'm asked, when not extracting teeth, do you use a surgical guide stent with the mono implants? Uh, I think that the mono implants uh, are, uh, as far as I know, they are used uh, freehand. I think that it, uh, I think that this is their ideal use. Uh, and uh, I think that, uh, Surgical stent uh, will, I didn't do surgical stents. I don't use surgical stents, but maybe be, this is because uh, I have less patient more, uh, maybe than others. Um, here I'm, yes. Give me one second, can you stop the share screen?
screen, please? Ah, can I stop the share? Yes. I'll yes, stop. stop the share so people can see. Okay, one moment. Stop the share. Yes, stop the share. Yes. yes. Uh, here I get the question in Hebrew. Uh, by the way, do you use in Avatarita Dafshir Shelot? Oimoto? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, so here I'm asked a question in Hebrew. Um, well, of course, uh, for the question in Hebrew, I was asked, uh, he said, why do you use temporary uh, bridge? Um, I use a temporary bridge uh, that is relatively strong. Uh, it was either polymethyl metacrylate that was, he what was uh, a little bit uh, bulgy. Uh, today, also, I'm using a strong material. It has never broke down. Uh, of course, uh, in some cases that uh, with, with very, very bruxist patients, I sometimes consider to do a metallic, uh, a metallic bridge from the beginning, but um, I almost don't get failures with the mono implants, even when I use temporary uh, a bridge, when I really put it, uh, when I really put it uh, Right, and the bridge sits very good, and it doesn't rock, and it doesn't uh, move. Uh, I'm asked by Dr. Namrata Gupte, it is, is it compulsory to load or split implant within three days? I would say that even uh, in ten, even in one week, I can say that uh, we can surely do that, because by definition, as to histology, bone resorption, uh, starts uh, two weeks approximately after the procedure because we know that implanting actually or doing the drilling is uh, for the for our body uh, it doesn't really recognize between uh, implantation and fracture so I think that the safe zone is somewhere up to seven uh, seven days you can do it is still considered immediate loading. Uh, by the literature, even up to two weeks, it is still uh, immediate loading. Uh, what about the jumping graft? Do you prefer not to use bone graft? I always use uh, bone grafts for uh, spaces uh, bigger than uh, two millimeters. As I said before, I always try not to open flaps when I, always, when I can. What do you usually do with the excess of cement? I, I try to get minimum excess of cement. I always try to find it because as I told you before, when there are excesses of cement and I don't see them, uh, they will stuck uh, below the undercut and then you will not be able to take the bridge out and it can even harm the implant sometimes. Uh, I'm asked if they, these are rough surface implants only, or do you use smooth surface also? Uh, for the mono, the surface is rough, but uh, my next lecture will speak about the cortical. It has also a smooth surface, uh, a polished surface, and a uh, rough surface. Um, Peri-implantitis. I found it less in those implants than in regular implants. Maybe because of the fact that is that in this implant, there is no connection between the abutment and the implant. This connection I found by the years that uh, uh, the connection between the abutment and the implant, the micro leakage uh, are really uh, serious problems. As to my concern is how we can treat peri-implantitis in one-piece implants. I think that we can treat it uh, as to uh, as with other implants. I would say that if the if the um, uh, peri-implantitis is small, we can treat it really locally. But uh, Dr. Muhammad, I believe that uh, the best treatment for peri-implantitis in sometimes. Uh, I'm sorry to say that is to take out the implant and to do a new one. But uh, in really small of, uh, cases of peri-implantitis, I treat. But in cases that I see that they advance, I don't want to cheat myself and I just take out the implant, of course, uh, on my count. And I do it again for the patient because I want the patient to be healthy 
uh, and not lo less important than that, satisfied. I'm asked what are the problems you faced when using the mono implants? Actually, the main problem that I faced, and this is the reason that I was really afraid to do that for many years, is the problem that I cannot bend the implant, that actually the angle that I put the implant was, was final. Uh, I'll, I'll tell another thing that I think about it now. The implant may look for you as implant for beginners. I have to say that uh, this implant is, um, is very complicated because if you use an implant that you cannot bend, you have to really understand how the prosthetic really work uh, in order to put the implant in the correct place. I think that today, when I can bend the implants, uh, the implant is not only for pros, those who did really, really uh, many cases. I think that this implant is, uh, well, I can, I can say that this implant can be done by all the practitioners. But I think that the main reason I stopped over the years to do that is was that I was afraid that I don't, I'm not experienced enough in order to use them. Uh, I'm asked by an anonymous attendee uh, if the implant fails after some years, uh, do I have to uh, bend the, the abutment? I would say that um, if the implant has failed in an area, I think that the bone is already more susceptible to problems than, uh, than usual. I would be as much conservative as possible when I'm doing, uh, when I'm redoing an implant. Uh, how to retrieve uh, an implant if you fracture an implant? Very good question. Actually, in the old way, as I showed in the lecture, uh, you had to uh, work with Zakaria a little bit and then to take it out or with a drill. When you drilled and worked with the implant, it just it went out and with a luxator. Today, with the new implants, we have an hex. And with the new key, you just enter the key to the hex and you take out the implant with no, let's say, with no harms. So uh, if you don't have uh, any questions, uh, thank you all. Um, okay, here I have more, uh, three more questions. Using bendable implants in the posterior extension is scary because its neck may break. It happened with me after five years. What do you think? Yes, it's right. If you uh, saw my movie uh, in the posterior area, I try not to put bendable implants but I'm putting implants with more prominent neck because uh, it almost happened to me. Uh, Dr. Basim Shakir asked me, I did notice you had placed an implants in a site with sinus and probably an infection. Uh, how do you cure the area and place local antibiotic and bone graft? When I do those cases, especially those difficult cases, I cover the patient with augmentin and dalacin uh, two days before. So the infected site is treated more or less better than to put uh, antibiotics topically. Uh, I try, I try uh, not to um, immediate load on the sinus site unless I have some implants and then the area of the sinus, I put it totally submerged. But uh, I agree with you, Basim, that uh, it's a quite of risk to do that. Uh, as much as I can, I try to avoid um, loading an implant in a closed sinus area. A, another question that I'm asked by Dr. Luigi, is there a possibility of a neck fracture in time? Yes, as I told before, yes. As much as we go posterior, I would use more prominent necks. Today, with the next, with the new implants, it is at least easy to take out the implants in those cases. Um, okay, a replacement of full upper arch. 
type of uh, final prosthesis you prefer. Um, metal. Uh, the zirconia is not uh, strong enough in order to withstand it. Um, Boson feels to metal, of course. Well, I'm waiting for more questions if you have. If not, I'll terminate the, le the lecture. Okay. So what do I have more? Um, chat, I have here in the chat. Okay, I'll check the chat. And then in the chat, I, I would like to see here if um, if if I find uh, questions that I didn't um, hear the bridge. Here I answered. Do you check the talk after replacing the mini implants? The talk is more or less uh, above forty in order to in order to. Uh, immediately load the implant. What is the minimum torque? As I said, I think 45. Uh, the space between implant and the abutment is actually the neck. And the neck is the actually the thing that lets me uh, really bend the implant. Uh, here I just uh, read the questions and ask her and ask peri and um, and fractures. Uh, yes, it can happen, I think less, and as to fractures, they happen. So I always try to put a nice amount of implants, so even if the neck uh, uh, was broken, still I can uh, take out the implant and use the other implants, but really, it rarely happened to me. Um, here I answered, in immediate implantation, mandibular which is the correct direction. Always the correct direction is the direction of the bone, of the best bone. You have to put the implant where the bone is best, but to take, of course, uh, into consideration that if the difference is too big, uh, I would uh, do this case with multi-units and maybe not with uh, mono-bendable. Um, do you realize also crystal sinus lift? Uh, most of the cases I do closed, although I started uh, my practice with open sinus lifts. Today, I believe in minimally invasive surgery as much as I, uh, as I can. This is what my experience really tells me. As much as you leave the flaps in place, as much as you open less, uh, it will be better. Uh, uh, excess cement, uh, what kind of bone do you use? I always use xenografts. Uh, this is the best bone for the sinus. This is the bone that I'm used to. Uh, I know that, uh, that there are a, today a, a big argue. I was a lecturer for, the, for bones, but I found in my practice, in my hands, uh, the best works for me with uh, xenografts. Um, here I'm asked if I am by Ronit, uh, how do I put the implants in the height of the bone or if I go a little bit below? A uh, very good question, Ronit, uh, and hello. Uh, I always uh, try to put the implant, all the threads in the implant. Sometimes I even sink a little bit uh, the neck into, but of course, always all the implant is below. Uh, the matter for the neck with me is an aesthetic question only, because I always try to make the neck below the gingiva, because it's polished, untouched, and uh, I think that the gingiva reacts to it very good. The implant is made, uh, I'm asked by uh, Dr. Elek Yefet, uh, what material is the implant made of? Uh, titanium, uh, I think titanium grade six, if someone here knows uh, better. Titanium, do you have something to say, Pinav? No, it's you, Greg. Uh, yes, I think titanium grade six, if I uh, really remember the catalog that I learned by heart when I was uh, yeah. Um, yes. yeah, tell me we need to finish. 
Yeah. Okay. I believe that I believe that I uh, I believe that I answered uh, most of the question. Uh, actually, most of them are uh, are are asked. I would say. Okay. Thank you very much. Keep safe, everybody. Thank you very much. You're welcome to to join our upcoming uh, webinar with Johnny, of course, and others. And uh, keep safe. Have a good night and good day. Thank you. Thank you very much.